Good afternoon, grace and peace be unto each and every one of you from God our Father. Certainly, I thank God for your presence with us for this noonday Bible study. That's right, we're doing noonday Bible studies on Facebook now. We historically we do them in the fellowship hall, but we uh, had quite a few people asked to do these online as well. So on Tuesdays we'll be studying biblical doctrine. That's right, what God has to say about certain things, whether it's Christology or what you believe about. Jesus Christ, pneumatology, which is what you believe about the Holy Spirit, uh, salvation, and so many other things. So I'm excited as we dig deeper into God's Word. For a frame of reference, we'll be looking at the book by John MacArthur, Biblical Doctrine, but we'll also be looking at books by authors like Paul David Tripp, who talks about 12 essential doctrines for everyday life. Before we get into God's Word, let's pray. God, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for how it helps us live, move, and it is through you we live, move, and have our being. And so, God, I pray that those who are watching today are blessed by this Bible study, that they are encouraged, they are empowered, that they are inspired, and they receive information that they did not have. Bless us now, O oh God, in our study. Bless us in everything that we do. God, continue to bless New Hope Baptist Church. Help it to be a church without spot or wrinkle. Bless the disciples who will continue to go forth and spread the good news. Lord, let us grow. Let us reach the lost. And God, as we continue to minister to your people, in all things, may we be blessed. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for this world. So much going on. We pray for peace across all nations. We pray for hope and joy for all generations. God, we pray that you bless us indeed and enlarge our territory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what is theology? What is uh, this system? It is a study of God. It is the science of God, if you will. It is about the word of God, but all things in reference to God. You may not know this or believe this, but everyone is a the theologian because everyone has a perspective about God. Whether they're an atheist, agnostic, or a nun, they still have some perspective of God. And so whether you're in the barbershop whether you're in church, whether you're in the temple, the mosque, everyone is a theologian. This term is not exclusive to Christianity, but of course we will be studying Christian theology. And theology shapes us, it is our beliefs about God and about ourselves that help dictate each and every move that we make. One definition says theology is the sustained effort to know the character will and acts of the triune God as he has disclosed and interpreted these for his people in scripture. He does this in order that we might know him, learn to think our thoughts after him, live our lives in his world and on God's terms and by thought and action project God's truth into our own time and culture. I've heard many preachers say that their favorite theologians are their grandmothers because they had a firm faith. They believed God. You didn't have to go to seminary or theology school to have great theology. You just have to have faith and an understanding of God's word and who God is. And so I invite all of you theologians to this study with me. In fact, if you feel led, uh, purchase the book by John MacArthur, Biblical Doctrine. But most importantly, follow along with me as we talk about various parts of theology. We'll talk about doctrine. That's going to be the main theme of these next uh, few weeks, uh, which is teaching. it. Let me say a little bit more about that. But before I do that, I just wanted to present a few forms of theology. There's biblical theology, uh, there's dogmatic theology, which deals more with doctrine. What does this scripture, uh, how does this scripture fit in a various doctrine? There's exegetical theology, which breaks down line upon line, precept upon precept. There's liberation theology, which is very popular amongst black and brown people. It talks about how God delivers and sets people free. It often leans more towards the social justice realm, and some people are fans of it. Some are not. Again, theology comes in many ways, shapes and forms and sizes, and some people cater more to certain forms of theology than others. There's practical theology, which I'm a student of. We look at everyday life. How 
does the word of God minister to everyday situations? And it often breaks down systematic theology in more plain language. There's renewal theology, which deals with charismatic worship. It is more geared to a Pentecostal focus. It talks about how God revives, renews, and how the Holy Spirit moves in such a powerful way. It takes pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, and expounds upon it. So I encourage you, if any of these uh, are, you're interested in, if any of these have uh, seem interesting to you, take time and dig even deeper into these types of theology. Now, some of you may have said, what is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. Doctrine represents the teaching that is considered authoritative. When Christ taught, the crowds were amazed at his authority, at his doctrine. Uh, a church's doctrinal statement contains a body of teaching used as the standard of authoritative orthodoxy or the standards, the foundational teachings that they live upon that navigates each and every move they make. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word lakak uh, means what is received or accepted teaching. It can be variously translated as instruction, learning, or teaching. And one thing I want to press upon you is that in order to be a child of God, you have to be teachable. You have to be constantly seeking to grow and learn about God. Whether you're affiliated with a church or not, you should want to know more about God because that will also teach you more about yourself. In the New Testament, two Greek words are translated as doctrine, instruction, or teaching. There's the didache, and then Paul used another word, the didaskalea. Um, both of these words ref refer to teaching, learning, instruction. It was very important for the disciples, which that term means student, to learn about God. They constantly watched God and experienced an encounter with God. They believed not just in shouting, not just in running around, but they wanted to know more about God. And I believe if you're watching today, you have the similar type spirit where you want to know more about God. In learning more about God, it is important to get accurate, sound doctrine. Um, bad doctrine is out there. False prophets, false teachers are out there. Let's keep it 100. Let's be honest. There is such a thing as bad teaching, but there's also such a thing as good teaching. So I encourage anyone and everyone to line yourself up with a church or a ministry in which the teaching is very sound. No one knows it all, so we all need to continue to seek and it is very helpful to be exposed to great teaching that continues to dig deeper so that you can get revelation as well as knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I want to talk to you about the value of sound doctrine. Sound doctrine exposes and confronts sin. That's right. Many people go off their own vices and they do whatever they want to do. But when you have strong biblical teaching, you know right from wrong. And I believe when you know better, you should do better. Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, but there's other things he mentions as well. Sound doctrine marks a good servant of Jesus Christ. When you know the word of God and what you should do, you have humility. You're willing to serve. You want to help other people and God can use you to be a blessing to others. Paul writes about this as well in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. The apostle Paul writes a lot about doctrine in his epistles as he was teaching the church and helping them grow, mature, and develop. He talked a lot about doctrine. Sound doctrine is rewarded with double honor. That means those who can follow the word of God, live it out. God has a promise of double honor, especially those elders of the church. That's those who are in leadership, who teach and preach the word of God. This is not suggesting that preachers are special or better than anybody else. This is just saying that those who can rightly divide God's word, God has a special place in his heart for them. Those who take the time to make sure that the doctrine is correct, God has special things for them. Any of you can take the time to study God's word, properly live it, and properly properly teach it to other people. Sound doctrine conforms to godliness. It is through sound doctrine that many of our lives are transformed. We are changed. The ways of the world and the wages of sin is death. And the ways of the world are all over the place. But once a person gets a hold of some sound doctrine and the good book and the good word and taught properly, then they can live out their life in a godly way. Now, I, I know 
The Bible has been used for wrong things. People have misappropriated scripture, misapplied scripture in order to do things like slavery, the Holocaust, and so many other things. And this is why it is important. Not only does your life depend on it, but other people's lives depend on sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is essential to equipping shepherds, pastors, leaders, because without it, you will lead people astray. And so if there's anybody who is given the assignment to care for others, leaders, please listen to me. It is important that you don't just take a, a text and do anything with it, but you need sound doctrine. You need to preach the word in season and out of season in the way God has called us to do. Sound doctrine is spiritually profitable. It helps one grow. It helps one live out. It gives people guidance so that they don't make the same mistake over and over again. It guards people. It protects them, one, against sin, but also the tricks of the enemy. Uh, sound doctrine was central to the early church. If you look at many of the epistles, there were many false prophets. When you look at Jude, 1 John, even some of Paul's letters, uh, in even Hebrews, there were so many epistles that addressed bad teaching. It was very important to God that we rightly divide God's word and that we look at it properly. And so I hope and pray that as we go through this study, we will be able to look at some things more clearly. Today is just the introduction, but I hope and pray that we have a heart for having sound doctrine, not just looking at a text and making up anything, but saying, God, what is your intent what was your intent by the author? What was your intent for the original audience? What is your intent for us today? There is no doctrine without the Bible, no Christian doctrine without the Bible, uh, I should say. And the Bible has a nice order of flow. And the author here, he gives the flow of the Bible. He says the flow of history throughout the Old Testament moves through the following lines. And we will look at these various topics at some point throughout our study. We'll look at creation. Uh, some argue there's two creation stories. Some argue was humanity perfect in their creation. And then after the fall, did man change? Um, people look at uh, free will, choice, things of that nature. Uh, when we look at creation, we also deal with the fall of man and, and what happened in the garden. We look at judgment and the flood over the earth. One of the passages uh, that I have doctrinally struggle with historically is Genesis 6 and 6, where God was so disappointed with humanity that he regretted creating man on earth. Our loving, powerful, perfect, wise, and so many other things God regretted making people. And so what God did was he took a flood and he recreated humanity, starting with Noah and his family. I'm not going to dig too deep into that, uh, but I'm just being transparent. That was one of those passages, and you too probably have passages that you struggled with at some point in life. But we keep going into God's word. We keep praying over it that God gives us clear understanding as to what exactly is happening. After the flood, we have the patriarchs of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, co called the fathers of the chosen nation. Then we go through the historical book the Deuteronomistic historical books. Uh, we look at exile, look at the Exodus, we look at the conquest of Canaan, we look at the era, the era of Judges, we look at the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, and then the exile in Babylon. Yes, we start with exile in Egypt and then we move forward to exile in Babylon. And then there are some post-exilic books that we look at as well. The Bible in the Old Testament is divided into several categories. You have the law or the Torah. You have the books of history, the books of wisdom, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. In Hebrew, they call it the Tanakh. You have the Torah, you have the Netvi'im, and the Ketvi'im. Yeah, uh, there's various words that we can look at, and they're also spoken in different languages as well. We're not going to dig too deep in that today, but I just wanted to expose you a little bit to how the Word of God is broken down in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you have the Gospels, you have the Book of History, you have the Pauline Epistles, you have the General Epistles, and then you have what some call the Book of Prophecy, the prophetic book, the Revelation of John. Then, once you get an understanding of those books, it is almost guaranteed you will have challenges. You will have people who don't believe in the Bible or believe different things. And you have to know how to address opposition and bad doctrine. One of the things you must do is speak the truth in love. One of the indictments against the church is that we've been too harsh, too critical of other people. And so it is important as a person who carries God's word, who carries God's truth, is that you share it in love. 
you catch more bees with honey. And so it is important that you are able to articulate your faith in such a positive and loving way that even if it convicts the other person, they know that you mean them no harm. Teach sound doctrine. Hold fast to sound doctrine. In life, you will be exposed to so many different things, so many different interpretations of a text, so many different uh, possible applications. You need to hold fast to what you know is right. Refute false doctrine. That means if somebody teaches you something that you know is not right, don't let it sink in. Don't receive it. Don't let it seep into your heart and your mind, but rather stay with what is true. One of the ways in which our doctrine is often attacked is there are so many different views throughout the world. Uh, essentially, a Christian worldview contrasts with competing worldviews in that it recognizes the God of the Bible as the unique source of all truth. That's right. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. When you believe that, you subject yourself to biblical doctrine. You believe that the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God and that God uses it to teach, to reach, and to save souls. That the word of God relates all truth back to an understanding of God and his purposes for this life and when we transition to glory. Second, a Christian worldview must be used as an essential tool in evangelism to answer the questions and objections of the unbeliever. That's right, it is very important and very helpful to know what you're talking about when you try to reach other people. Even if you just have your testimony, it helps to know what exactly God did in your life. And if you can truly answer, yes, I am saved and I shall be saved. I'm justified, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, all of that good stuff. It is good to have a strong foundation in what you believe. It must be clearly understood that the final analysis is up to God. God is the righteous judge, but God gives us insight and clarity on God's purposes for the world. Finally, a Christian worldview is foundational in the realm of discipleship to inform and mature a true believer in Christ with regard to the implications and ramifications of one's faith, one's Christian faith. Yes, in order for you to grow, you must know what God wants for you. There are so many Christians that have no idea about the faith or about the Bible. Many other faith-based systems have very deep understanding or people have very deep understanding of what they believe. Too often when a person asks a Christian, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you love God? Many people do not answer that question or cannot answer that question. So it is my hope and my prayer and my plea that after we get through this Bible study, not just tonight, but I'm talking about the entire series, that you have a greater understanding of how you're saved, what God has done in your life, and how you can share it with other people for the purpose of discipleship. We want to be a church that makes disciples, that makes disciples. That's right. We want people to grow to a point where you can teach, you can preach, you can lead, you can serve, you can do so many things. And it is imperative to know what you're talking about. Have you ever been to a presentation where a person clearly didn't know what they were talking about and it just threw you off? You could even ask that person, what were you talking about today? And if they say, I don't know, then how could the audience know? And so again, the aim of this uh, series is so that you know more about God, know more about yourself. And we'll get back into studies of certain books of the Bible. In fact, after we get through this, we'll be in Romans. And on Wednesday nights, we'll do Celebration of Discipline, which will also dive deeply into God's Word. But right now, we're, de we're dealing with uh, Christian doctrine. We're dealing with doctrine and theology. And since this is Mental Health Awareness Month, I want to talk a little bit about how your theology affects your mind and your lifestyle. Uh, mental health matters. And so we want the mind to be one like Christ. We want the mind to be subject to the will of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the author gives several types of minds uh, that have been affected by theology. There's the redeemed mind, the renewed mind, the illuminated mind, the Christ-like mind, the tested mind, the profitable mind, and the balanced mind. One of the things you do not want to have is a reprobate mind, one who is yielded to sin and refuses what God is saying and doing in one's life. You want to have an open heart and an open mind. And let's look at what uh, the author John MacArthur has to say about these various types of mind who have been positively impacted by the Holy Spirit. The redeemed mind. 
Uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. As a result of salvation, the mind of a newly redeemed person knows and comprehends the glory of God. Let me say that again. As a result of salvation, the mind of a newly redeemed person knows and comprehends the glory of God. Whereas this person was previously blinded by Satan's sin and self, they are now they now possess the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation in Ephesians 6 and 17 protects the mind against the schemes of the of the enemy, the schemes of the devil. No longer is this person left vulnerable against the devil, but they are protected by God. They are empowered by God. Their life has been changed. They have been delivered, redeemed, and set free. Is there anybody watching today that could say they have been redeemed, bought with a price? Jesus has changed their whole life. If you've been redeemed, then you should not do everything you used to do. Redemption suggests that someone has reached in and pulled you back. You were going to hurt yourself, but God saw fit to save you. And you said yes to your will and yes to your way. But that's not the only kind of mind. Let's look at the next one. The renewed mind. When a person enters into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they become a new creation. That's scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. They sing a new song, and that's in Psalm 98. The mind acquires a new way to think and a capacity to put off old sinful ways of thinking. Unquestionably, God is in the business of mind renewal. God wants to transform the renewing of your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's in Romans 12 and 2. But we also see God's desire for renewed minds in Christians in Ephesians 4 and 23 and Colossians 3 and 10. The Bible says to set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, but rather heavenly, beautiful, wonderful, godly things. Paul puts this concept in military terms. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Yes, every thought. Yes, you can't be distracted by all these other things of the world. But God's will is that every thought be catered to the glory of God. Every thought be fixed on God in such a way that those distractions of the enemy, those schemes of the devil, they cannot take you down. And when you think about God, it positively impacts your relationships, your health, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, your product, your productivity on your job. It just changes everything for the better. So keep your mind stayed on him and God will give you perfect peace. How do we do this? How do we get, have the renewed mind? Scripture reveals the mind of God. Not all of God's thoughts, because his ways are not our, our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. But scripture helps us to have a renewed mind and to focus on being more like God. That's why the Apostle Paul encouraged the Colossians to let the word of Christ dwell within them. And as the word dwells in you even more, it helps you to have a renewed mind. The illuminated mind. The Bible says that believers need God's help to understand God's word. Consequently, the spirit of God enlightens the minds of believers so that they might comprehend, embrace, and obey the truths revealed in scripture. That means we can't fully grasp God's word on our own, but the Holy Spirit helps us to have great insight into what God is saying. Consequently, the spirit of God enlightens the minds of believers so that we can know the depth and the whip and the breadth of all that God has to say about us and for us. Theologians call this illumination. A great prayer to have illumination uh, as, as one study scripture is to ask God to open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your word. We see that prayer mentioned in Psalm 119.18. It acknowledges an indispensable need for God's light in scripture. It is basically saying, God, I need you to better understand this. Holy Spirit, I need you to better understand your word so that I can live out your word in the way you intended. Texts like Psalm 119, verse 33 and 34 say, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will 
keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law, your word, and observe it with my whole heart. Don't ever get so arrogant that you feel like you totally know everything about God and scripture. No, we not need to constantly pray these prayers. Teach me, O Lord, that I may uh, know your word, that I may live out your statues. Open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your word. God, teach me, show me, show me the way. Then there's the Christ-like mind, and we're almost through. Christians should be altogether glad to embrace the certain and true mind of God the Father. That's why Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The ultimate pattern of Christian mindedness is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of it. He's the great example. Paul declares, but we have the mind of Christ. And some may say, how can this be? Well, we have it with the Bible which is God's sufficient special revelation for each and every one of us. And that as we have this mind, then we draw closer to God. Of course, no one is perfect. No one will completely exhaust being Christ-like mind, Christ minded. However, when you have a mind like Christ, you do things different. You, are, you embrace the will of God in your life and you react and respond to things in a more Christ-like way. Like when somebody cuts you off as you're driving, you don't just... Uh, go off and yell at them, but you you pray God's blessings upon them or you wish them peace. Uh, when somebody does something wrong to you, you show them Christian love. When you see a person in need, rather than just walking past them, you have compassion and you want to do an act of service or an act of kindness towards them. Things like that are a reflection of the Christ-like mind because Jesus was so sacrificial, so loving, so giving, and he wants us to do the same thing for other people. The tested mind. Now, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the Christian mind should be a repository of God's revealed truth. It should not quake, waver, compromise, or bend in the face of opposing ideas or seemingly superior arguments, which means when people come to test you or challenge your faith, you don't fall back, you don't fall down, you don't give up, you don't run away, but rather you are equipped and prepared in what they call apologetics, being able to defend your faith. Even after salvation, Satan continues his intellectual rampage. Thus, Paul had great concern for the Corinthian church. Paul said, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Eve had allowed Satan to do some thinking for her. Then she did some of her own thinking independent of God. When her conclusions differed from God's, she chose to act on her conclusions rather than on God's commands, which is sin. So for those who don't know, I'm talking about the fall. As soon as Eve allowed what God said to be questioned, she was doing her own independent thinking. She was being tested by the serpent and she failed that test. Likewise, many of us have been tested, maybe not by the serpent, but friends, family, and otherwise, people who will question your faith. Why do you tithe? Why do you go to church? Why do you sing in a choir? Why do you believe in this God? How can you believe in this same religion that was used to do this and do that? You have to be strong in your faith so that when tests come, you can stand the test of time. Satan aims his fiery darts at the minds of believers. Satan knows that if they get your mind first, if he gets your mind, everything else will follow. The enemy wants to make the th your thought life a battlefield for spiritual conquest. There are many accounts, not just Eve, of people who, who's, who failed the test, but even the apostle Peter. Yes, before he became the great bishop and the great evangelist, yes, even he wavered in his faith. But I like what Peter later says in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. He says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to defend to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revere your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Basically, he's saying, always be prepared to defend your faith and do it in love, do it in gentleness, do it in kindness, so that if anybody tries to slander you, 
they'll be embarrassed. Everyone will know. No, that's that's not what sister so and so said. That's not what brother so and so did. They are a good person. Always be prepared to defend your faith and do it in love. The profitable mind. Psalm 19 provides detailed insight into a Christian's new relation to the Bible, and it is profitable not just for yourself, but also for other people. It is at peace with God and closer to oneness with God. The profitable mind reveals the mind of Christ, and Psalm 119 testifies to the importance and blessing of lingering over God's word. Yes, in order to have a profitable mind, you have to stay in the word of God. All 176 verses of Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, extol the virtue of living out the mind of God. Meditation is mentioned at least seven times as the habit of one who loves God and desires a closer intimacy with him. Yes, when you study God's word, when you want to know more about doctrine, it is good to be in a place of peace where noise is not around you and distractions are, are, are not prevalent, but rather a place where after you read God's word, you can meditate on it, you can you can pray on it, you can hear even more of what God has to say. Meditating on God's word will purify the mind of old thoughts that are not of God and reinforce new positive, godly, holy, and righteous thoughts. With a profitable mind, a believer will develop a great love for and tremendous delight in scripture. Second, a believer in Christ will have a strong desire to know God's word. And thirdly, knowing God will then lead to a Christian obeying him. And these things are profitable because without this direction, without this protection, without this guidance, you can do things that are harmful to yourself and other people. But with a mind fixed on God, you can protect yourself. You can go the right way. Now, I'm not saying that it'll be easy. I'm not saying it will be exempt from challenges, but it'll be the best way, the best thing you can do for your life. The mind is so imperative into one's life and their spirituality. Yes, what you think about feeds your soul. What you read, what you study feeds your thoughts. Um, anyone ever listen to certain music, it kind of makes you want to act a certain way. Likewise, when you study God's word, when you uh, spend time in devotion and meditation on, on God, then it affects you in a positive way. Paul gives us a recipe for what to feed the mind. He, he tells us to think about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent and worthy of praise. Think upon these things. And so child of God, as we move forward in studying biblical doctrine, I encourage you to keep your mind on God and to think about the things that are honest, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Next, we have the balanced mind. Some ask the question, are divine revelation and human reason like oil and water? Some people feel like spirituality and intellectualism cannot mix. Christians have sometimes reached two erroneous extremes in dealing with divine revelation and human reason. On one end of the spectrum, there's anti-intellectualism, which basically concludes that if a subject matter is not discussed in the Bible, then it is not worthy of serious study or thought. This unbiblical approach to learning and thinking leads to cultural and intellectual withdrawal. A person lacks relevance and understanding of the world they live in. And God told us to be in the world, but not of the world. Amen. At the opposite extreme is hyper-intellectualism, which embraces natural revelation at a higher level of value and credibility than God's special revelation in scripture. And when the two are in conflict, natural revelation is the preferred source of truth often. That means people prefer what they can see, the science that they can, uh, that everyone can understand. This unbiblical approach results in scriptural withdrawal, lack of reverence for the Bible, lack of study of the Bible, because people prefer the natural sciences. Here's what I argue. The author says this, and I 100% agree. Both special and general revelation, that is natural revelation, are necessary for cultivating a biblical mindset. The study of special revelation is the priority, but we also must have natural revelation. And 
the world needs this so much to try to moralize, politicize, or get into politics or intellectualize society without first seeing the spiritual matters or diving into God's word is to guarantee only a brief and generally inconsistent change that is shallow, low, weak, temporary, and not lasting, and ultimately not saving. We wanna change this world. If we wanna end warfare, we need spirituality. If we want to get the guns off the street, we need spirituality. We want to end poverty and homelessness, we need spirituality. Whatever we face, we cannot do one without the other. We need God's insight. We need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. It is also important that we have natural understanding. The goal in all of this is to be holy. Christians have been saved to be holy and to live holy lives. And what does it mean to be holy? Both the Hebrew and Greek words for to be holy, which that word appears over 2,000 times in scripture. That's how important it is to God. To be holy means to be set aside or set apart for something special. This God is holy in that he sets himself apart from creation, humanity, and all pagans and all other forms of deities by the fact of his deity and sinlessness. That's why the angels sing of God, holy, holy, holy in both the Old Testament in Isaiah 6 and the New Testament in Revelation 4. And this is why scripture declares God to be holy. Thus the idea of holiness takes on a spiritual meaning among the people of God based on the holy character of God. Child of God, I pray that you be holy and that God sets you apart. And yes, you are special. God wants to do some special things for you and through you. So be ye holy for God is holy. Next week, we'll deal with bibliology, which is the doctrine of God's word. So thank you for this introduction. Just wanted to cover some things that we will deal with in the next couple of weeks. And tomorrow night, we'll be in the book by Richard J. Foster, Celebration of Discipline. I hope I can see you there. I love you with the love of Christ. Have a great week. God bless.